Good morning. The subcommittee will come to order. I welcome you today to this hearing of the House Armed Services Committee Readiness Subcommittee on Amphibious Warfare Readiness and Training. Today, the subcommittee will hear from the Navy and Marine Corps regarding the status of amphibious training and readiness, specifically the challenges of amphibious ship availability in Navy and Marine Corps interoperability. We're also pleased to have the Government Accountability Office present to comment on their recent study of the amphibious operations training released in September 2017. I ask the witness to do their best to describe where shortfalls exist and what can be done to improve the less than optimal state we're in, in. Specifically, sp specifically how better and more consistent funding could help. We have held a number of readiness hearings and briefings on aviation, surface combatants, DOD infrastructure, and other topics. Every session points to the same grim conclusion. Our services are indeed in a readiness crisis. Marine expeditionary units aboard U.S. Navy amphibious vessels are an important element of our forward deployed strategic deterrent. To be effective, the Navy Marine Corps team must train together regularly, certainly more than they do today. Because we have too few ships, necessary training is not possible. President Ronald Reagan frequently used the phrase correctly, peace through strength. I agree with President Reagan and believe we have a higher level of defense funding must be achieved to achieve that goal. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on how this capability can be improved. Before I introduce the witnesses, I'm grateful to recognize Ranking Member Madeline Baidayo, the distinguished gentlelady from Guam, for opening comments she would like to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. I do look forward to discussing the challenges that are impeding amphibious training and the mitigations and long-term solutions to build and sustain readiness in the Marine Corps and the Navy. Amphibious operations are complex and they're difficult, to say the least. There is a tremendous amount of planning and preparations required to ensure the ships, sailors, and Marines and equipment are properly coordinated to ensure the success of a training event or in the event of a contingency operation, an actual amphibious landing. The GAO report clearly indicates there is currently a lack of overall strategy to allocating limited resources that are needed for amphibious training. The current operations tempo, as well as the limited number of ships, compound this challenge. It is clear that better coordination is required by the Navy and the Marine Corps to ensure this critical war fighting and skill is restored to a readiness level and is required to meet our operational planning needs. I am encouraged to see that both the Navy and the Marines have concurred with all three recommendations made by GAO, and I intend to monitor the progress uh, as both services work to restore this amphibious operation readiness. This committee is keenly aware of the continuing impacts of sequestration and unpredictable funding on readiness in every aspect of the services. I encourage the witnesses to share specific examples of how unpredictable funding has impacted their ability to conduct amphibious operations training. And I look forward to the training, and thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I yield and back. Thank you, Ranking Member Badayo. In connection with today's hearing, we welcome members of the full committee who are not members of the Readiness Subcommittee who are or will be willing to attend. I ask unanimous consent that these committee members be permitted to participate in this briefing with the understanding that all sitting subcommittee members will be recognized for questions prior to those not assigned to the subcommittee. Without objection, so ordered. I'm pleased to recognize our witnesses today. I want to thank them for taking the time to be with us and their service to our nation. We have Lieutenant General Brian Boudreau, Deputy Commandant for Plans, Policies, and Operations, U.S. Marine Corps. Vice Admiral Andrew L. Woody Lewis, the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Operations, Plans, and Strategy, U.S. Navy. And we have Mr. Kerry Russell, Director of Defense Capabilities and Management of the U.S. Office, U.S. Government Accountability Office. We will now ask each panel member to make brief opening remarks before we proceed to member questions under the very strict five-minute rule of Mr. Warren.
Begin with Jim Boudreau. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bodayo, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, good morning, and, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before this subcommittee. Today, Marines and sailors are at sea operating as amphibious ready groups, Marine Expeditionary Units. We have the America Arg in the 15th Mew out in the Central Command region, with some of its personnel about to embark on Allied ships. We have the Bonhomme Richard in the 31st Mew out in the Pacific, the Iwo Jima Arg is off the east coast of the United States with the 26 Mew embarked, preparing to deploy. And we have Black Sea Rotational Marines uh, aboard DDGs uh, getting ready to exercise in the, in the European theater. So your expeditionary forces and readiness are postured forward and are accomplishing our national security objectives. The Marine Corps reviewed the GAO report on Navy and Marine Corps training, and we agree with the study, its findings, and its recommendations. Today's testimony provides the Navy and Marine Corps the opportunity to inform the readiness subcommittee on the challenges associated with amphibious operations training, discuss our shortfalls, and describe our projected way ahead. The current inventory of 32 amphibious warships is short of our need to satisfy operational requirements, which does negatively impact the Naval Force's ability to generate readiness and negatively affects availability for training with larger scale formations. The amphibious force structure is projected to grow to a total of 34 ships starting in fiscal year 21. And the Marine Corps supports the 38 ship requirement and the requisite funding to develop readiness while concurrently fulfilling validated joint requirements, accomplishing necessary fleet maintenance, and maintaining capacity to respond to potential contingencies. And as the amphibious ship inventory builds toward 38 ships in fiscal year 33, the Navy and Marine Corps team will continue to explore innovative ways to employ alternative platforms. So on behalf of our Marines and sailors, civilians and their families, we thank the Congress and this committee for the opportunity to discuss the key challenges your Navy and Marine Corps face. We thank you for your support. The most important actions that Congress can take now is to immediately repeal the caps on defense spending in the Budget Control Act and provide a defense appropriation that ensures sufficient, consistent, and predictable funding to train, man, and equip your Navy and Marine Corps. And with your help, we'll overcome these constraints and enable your Navy and Marine Corps team to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Mr. Chairman, I have submitted a, a written statement for the record, and uh, I'd ask that to be accepted. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. General, thank you very much. And um, we, uh, the persons who are here on the uh, subcommittee uh, certainly endorse your uh, statement in regard to the Budget Control Act sequestration. Uh, I'd like to now proceed to Admiral Lewis. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bordile and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today, alongside General Boudreau. The team before you is inextricably linked. In our past, I've commanded Marines, and he has commanded sailors. We train together, deploy together, and fight together. Our bond has been strengthened over the centuries of our great services, and today we look forward to testifying how we will continue that bond in the future. I request my written statement be be submitted for the record, and I will keep these remarks brief. Right now, your Navy Marine Corps team is forward deployed and standing the watch. Sailors and Marines are at sea aboard the American Amphibious Readiness Group with the 15th Mew in Central Command, USS Bonhomme Richard Amphibious Readiness Group with the 31st Mew in the Pacific, and Iwo Jima Amphibious Readiness Group with the 26th Mew in the Atlantic, preparing to deploy. We are at the tip of the spear and working every day to sharpen it. We reviewed the GAO report on Navy Marine Corps amphibious operations and training and agree with the, with the study, its findings, and its recommendations. We appreciate the opportunity to inform the readiness subcommittee of the challenges associated with Navy Marine Corps <coughs> amphibious operations training and integration, discuss our shortfalls, and lay out a projected way ahead. The GAO report finds the Navy shortage of amphibi amphibious ships to be detrimental to our ability to train. The 32 amphibious ships currently in the fleet are stressed to meet both combatant commander operational requirements, ongoing contingency operations, and disaster relief, which impacts the ability of the Navy and Marine Corps to improve readiness and train as an integrated force. Continuing resolutions and caps imposed by the Budget Control Act have impacted our ability to plan and implement training, ship maintenance, and modernization. While we have prioritized maintenance and readiness dollars, the positive effects of prioritized funding will not remove these deficits in the near term. 
Restoring the readiness of the fleet requires predictable, stable, and adequate funding over several years to ensure that we can conduct the required maintenance on our ships. This stability would help the Navy to restore stocks of necessary parts, get more ships to sea on time, and better prepare sailors and Marines for deployment. Although a continuing resolution may be better than no funding at all, cost, the cost associated with not being able to start new work cannot be overstated. Delays in shipyard maintenance periods cause ships to either have their training pipelines compressed or maintenance deferred. Deferred maintenance creates an increase in cost due, a, due to a corresponding increase in machinery to repair. At the same time, the value of skilled artisans is amplified when work is stopped due to a lack of a labor force possessing the qualifications to complete the repairs. Work stoppages created by a continuing resolution force artisans to seek alternate, more stable employment. Skilled shipyard workers require two to four years of training to reach journeyman certification and five to 10 years to reach master. Shipyards and skilled workers require stable, predictable funding to maintain their skilled workforce and invest in these critical training programs in order to maintain and grow the shipyard capacity we need. Maintaining the fleet is not enough to ensure readiness when adversary capabilities continue to improve. We need a more lethal and effective force which can only be realized through modernization and new technologies. The same stable, predictable, and adequate funding required for maintenance is critical to the new programs and additional capacity we need to get better. We are working together to overcome these challenges at the direction of the Chief of Naval Operations and the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Through the Naval Board, the service has incorporated processes to pos posture for increased training and integration. Commander of the United States Fleet Forces Command and Commander U United States Marine Forces Command established a co-led maritime working group to provide an enduring inter-service collaborative process that integrates capabilities, force development, experimentation, and emergency and emerging requirements with exercise planning, scheduling, and resourcing. Commander U.S. Pacific Fleet and Commander U.S. Marine Forces Pacific have similarly developed the Pacific Naval Integration Working Group to represent the Pacific issues. These four commands meet together quarterly to include a meeting at this time in Hawaii. On behalf of all Marines, sailors, civilians, and their families, we thank the Congress and this committee for your support and this opportunity to discuss the key challenges your Navy and Marine Corps face. The President's fiscal year 2018 request and the recently passed National Defense Authorization Act look toward fleet homeless and funding to man, train, and equip and organize the Navy and Marine Corps. These funds will only work if they are approved in a consistent, predictable, and timely manner. With your help, we will overcome these constraints and reshape your Navy and Marine Corps to meet the challenges of the 21st century. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Admiral. We now proceed to Mr. Kerry Russell. Good morning. It's Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bordayo, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for having me here today to talk, talk about GEO's recent review of Navy and Marine Corps training for amphibious operations. The Navy and Marine Corps together maintain forces capable of conducting amphibious operations, that is, military operations launched from the sea using naval vessels to project a Marine Corps landing force ashore. As you know, the United States today faces a complex national security environment with threats ranging from large-scale traditional state actors to destabilizing non-state actors. Accordingly, the Navy and Marine Corps must have fully trained and ready forces to address these threats in the maritime domain. However, each of the military services today are generally smaller and less combat ready than they have been in many years. For example, over the past two decades, the number of Navy amphibious ships has decreased by 50 percent, from 62 ships in 1990 to the 32 that we have today. For my statement, I'm going to focus on three areas that we examined in our latest report. First, the Navy and Marine Corps' ability to complete training for amphibious operations and factors that limited that training. Second, steps taken by the Navy and Marine Corps to mitigate training shortfalls. And third, efforts to improve overall integration between the Navy and Marine Corps for amphibious operations training, referred to as naval integration. With respect to the first area on completing amphibious training, we found that the Navy's fleets of amphibious ships and associated Marine Corps combat units that were just about to deploy as part of those Marine Expeditionary Units had generally completed the needed training for amphibious operations. However, for that majority of forces not nearing a deployment, such as those conducting home station training to build and maintain core competencies, they fell considerably short of being able to complete amphibious training requirements. 
This was especially noticeable in Marine Corps infantry battalions and V-22 Osprey tilt rotor squadrons. These deficits can create a potential gap in the Marine Corps' ready bench of units. If called on, these units could be left scrambling to obtain last-minute training, risking their ability to be fully ready once deployed and underway. The most prevalent factor we found that hampered training completion was a lack of available amphibious ships on which to train. For example, data we collected obtained from the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, which operates out of the Pacific, showed that the Navy was unable to fulfill 93% of its requests for Navy ship support for training in fiscal year 2016. Other significant factors we identified across the Marine Corps that hampered training included limited access to range space and maintenance delays for amphibious ships. With respect to actions taken by the Navy and Marine Corps to mitigate training challenges, we identified some important steps that the services have taken. We had, uh, for example, the Navy, and working with the Marine Corps, has assessed its needs for amphibious ships to support current deployments while also providing for adequate training, and now plans to increase the number of ships in the amphibious fleet from 31 to 38. Also, the Marine Corps is currently evaluating its amphibious training requirements and the number of forces that must be trained and ready at any given time. However, despite these actions, we found that the service's current approach for amphibious operations training does not fully incorporate strategic training and leading risk management practices, such as prioritizing all available training resources. For example, the Marine Corps relies more on an ad hoc process to identify units that are available for home station training when an amphibious ship becomes available, rather than a process that would deliberately align the next highest priority units with those ships and other resources. Additionally, the Navy and Marine Corps have not systematically evaluated a full range of alternatives to achieve training priorities in light of the limited availability of amphibious ships. Further, while the Marine Corps has endeavored to incorporate simulators and other virtual devices into its training activities, we identified gaps in its processes to effectively develop and use them, namely weaknesses on the front-end planning and post-fielding evaluation of device effectiveness. And finally, with respect to naval integration for training activities, the Navy and Marine Corps have taken steps to improve coordination between the two services, but have not fully incorporated leading collaboration practices that would help drive these efforts. For example, the Navy and Marine Corps lack defined common outcomes that would help them create a more integrated approach to managing and executing their training programs. This completes my statement, and I would be pleased to respond to any questions you may have. And thank you very much, Mr. Russell, and I thank all of you for your succinctness. Uh, and we're going to begin now on the very uh, concise uh, five-minute rule. Uh, even before we begin, I, uh, yesterday, and um, uh, I was really um, uh, pleased that you, uh, and Admiral, you brought it up again, uh, the uh, consequence of uh, continuing resolution uh, re that we have, and uh, we're facing that now. And something that would be very helpful, as I mentioned, and I hope that um, both of you uh, could provide uh, succinct um, <coughs> examples of what the uh, additional costs are due to a continuing resolution. And in real world language, uh, very brief, uh, so that uh, Congressman Badayo can receive that, we would provide it to the rest of the subcommittee members so that we could uh, actually use that to explain to our constituents um, what the consequence of a continuing resolution is. Uh, and um, it would just be very helpful because it, it just doesn't come across as it should. So, um, uh, and, and we want to make it where uh, our constituents understand and also uh, even our colleagues. It would be good for them to understand too. Uh, Admiral Lewis, you clearly articulated in your written statement and in your opening remarks why it is so important to grow the number of amphibious ships currently in the Navy's inventory. Can you please comment on why you would need additional ships, particularly being challenged when the Navy has plans to take commissioned LSDs offline for up to four years at a time? Currently, LSD 46, USS Tortuga, does not have planned availability, uh, FY 16 to 19. Uh, can you please explain this uh, further? Yes, sir. The uh in regards to taking taking the ships offline for ma for maintenance, so, so these ships are old, and they are ships that, you know, so it's it's akin to uh, keeping a car that you've had for a long time, that the maintenance costs become further and further, and we have over time we've deferred these maintenance because of continuing resolutions. As an example of that of that deferred maintenance, 
the USS Gunston Hall went into maintenance, deferred an entire three-year deferral, increased the cost from $44 million to $111 million. And the time in maintenance went from 270 days to 696 days. Uh, that's, you know, if you compare that to the cost to your personal vehicle, that's, uh, you know, a couple months pay of all, all of us, regardless of, you know, what kind of car it is. So uh, that's, a, that's a big impact to those funds, those operating funds. That's, that's how we fund those maintenance. In the case of ships that we have taken offline, as you state, that we have really no other choice to do that because we don't have adequate funding under continuing resolutions to to do that maintenance, you know, right, you know, right in right in quick order. If we had more funding, we could, you know, tighten those timelines on that maintenance on those older ships. However, we have done the best that we can do with the funding that we have and spread that maintenance out over time. Well, I want to thank you for uh, raising it's not just cost, uh, but delay uh, and extension of time. And so if you could, in, if you all could include that, uh, not just cost, but uh, the consequence of uh, offline uh, and delay. And General Boudreaux, what specific elements of the Marine Corps atrophy and suffer the most from the lack of amphibious ships and training opportunities? Mr. Chairman, it's our ability to train at higher echelons above the Marine Expeditionary Unit and Amphibious Ready Group Unit. Our forcible entry capability, core competency of the Marine Corps and Navy team here is, uh, is at risk above the MU level. Simply, we can do some training through uh, of the command elements through uh, virtual systems, but at some point you have to put the ships to sea and go through a mission rehearsal. And the ability to generate the number of ships required to, to train at a Marine Expeditionary Brigade level just simply isn't there. So we take it in bite-sized chunks. We try to train elements of that MEB uh, the best we can, but it's very, very difficult lacking the capacity to put the entire MAGTAF and Navy team together uh, at sea. That's the greatest challenge we have, quite honestly, right now. Well, and I appreciate you pointing out that uh, virtual can be very helpful, but uh, it, it's the uh, actual practicality of the operation itself. At this time, we proceed to comments from Badayo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Russell, you identified concerns with the way the Navy and the Marine Corps were utilizing available training resources to conduct amphibious training. Can you please provide us with some specific examples where GAO felt the current process did not effectively prioritize training? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, well, let me start out by saying with respect to the, uh, the, the units that are just about to deploy for the, for the Marine Expeditionary Units, they were able to train and, and they, they were able to use those resources. Uh, the issues we had were with that ready bench, that group that was not ready to deploy. And what we found is that um, more often the, uh, the assignment of Navy ships to Marine Corps units was done more ad hoc based on the availability of the units uh, for the Marine Corps units to match up to the ship based on the availability of the ship rather than having a system of prioritization to look at those Marine Corps units that were most likely to need training earlier. So for example, some of those units that might be tagged to go as part of the special um, um, Marine uh, task forces, the SP MAGTAF, for example, or other things that might have a priority over others. That, that distinction was not made in the process. Rather, it was more of a matching of availability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Admiral Lewis and Lieutenant General uh, Boudreaux, given the concerns identified by GAO, I am concerned that additional funding targeted toward readiness may not be prioritized toward the units that have the highest needs. In light of the GAO report, can you describe what controls have been put in place or that you plan to put in place in the coming year? that will ensure readiness resources are properly allocated to the units with the most pressing needs. You, General, first. Thank you, ma'am. The I would say that, um, yes, we do have a plan, and, and there are controls in place, and, and it gets to um, what Mr. Russell just referred to. And we first ensure that we can meet our steady state requirement. Those next to deploy have to be trained and certified to go forward and, ex and execute their missions. Uh, 26 MU, for instance, right now is the priority effort to make sure they've got everything they need before they depart the East Coast of the United States to go forward into the Central Command region. 
secondly, it is the, uh, it's the ability to ensure of our old plan readiness. And that calls for units, of course, in number and in size greater than marine expeditionary units or amphibious ready groups. So we do take a look at our old plan requirements and try to focus those units because the units change all the time as units deploy on their normal schedule, battalions change and squadrons change. So we try to keep pace with the units that are back in, in, at home station that may be next to deploy. And that next to deploy focus is on those specifically that may have to meet an old plan requirement. Thirdly, it would be exercises. And with exercises comes experimentation. We can't afford to have sets of ships that are gonna exercise and then we need another set to experiment. We have integrated experimentation in with the exercises and I think Don Blitz is, uh, is our most recent example of that where we wanted to test our ability to shoot high mobility uh, artillery rocket system off of, a, uh, off of an amphibious platform, which, which proved itself. So uh, I would say that's the sequence, that's the plan. It's to, to make sure that those that are next to deploy, meeting O plan requirements, and then exercises and experimentation in that order. Thank you, thank you, General. Uh, Admiral? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, really to mirror what General Boudreau said, but I would, the first priority for funding, additional funding that we need would be go toward ship maintenance to, so as to be able to not have to defer any further maintenance and to uh, keep the maintenance time and cost and to get done on time so they can get out and start the training cycle. The training cycle is about a year long, six months in which we do the uh, basic unit level training with the Navy, with uh, Marines embarked with their basic core competencies. And then the second six months is an in fully integrated toward the higher end training. That, that, the prioritization really starts with that maintenance to make sure we start on time mm -hmm. and then we can, go, we can have the units that we have in the inventory, which is not enough, but we can have the units we have in the inventory to train with. And then the third priority would be at the higher end, the exercises, the larger uh, formation exercises where the experimentation mm -hmm. takes place as well. So maintenance, training, and exercises in yes, that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. We now proceed to Congressman Austin Scott of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Admiral, um, it's not lost on me that between the two of you, you have 66 years in service to the country. I think if uh, Mattis and Kelly combined probably have over 80 years of service to the country, and as I listen to uh, any of the four of you that have named talk, you, it, it's pretty clear that the sequester and um, the caps have done more damage. Uh, just Mattis has been very direct about it than any outside enemy to uh, our military and our capabilities. And I want to reiterate the point that, that I made yesterday, and I want to say this as res respectfully as I know how to do it. As long as you ask for a continuing resolution, you're going to get a continuing resolution. We can put an end to this madness by the end of this year, but only if men like you and, and um, General Kelly and General Mattis hold Congress's feet to the fire. Give us Christmas Eve, give us Christmas Day to go home to our families. There are a lot of men and women deployed around the world. Uh, make us stop this madness. But, but if General Mattis comes out and says, we need a continuing resolution, I promise you, you're gonna get a continuing resolution. That's, and, and, and from the members of Hask, I don't pretend to speak for all of them, but I will tell you that I think among the Democrats and the Republicans on Hask, we all want to help you solve this problem. All of us do. Uh, I believe, I believe that's true. No, it's not a partisan issue from the, the members who, who are on Hask. But I, I just, I promise you, if Madison Kelly asks for a continuing resolution, you're going to have a continuing resolution. And until you hold Congress's feet to the fire, you're going to have to watch uh, our capabilities further degrade. And so I would just ask for your help uh, in speaking with them and making sure 
that they say no more continuing resolutions. If Congress has to cancel going home for Christmas, then Congress can ha cancel going home for Christmas just like the soldiers do. Um, but again, I, I respect both of you, uh, all three of you, and thank you for your service. And I just hope that we can put an end to this madness by December 31st. But it's up to you. I'm, it, it, it's up to y'all. Mattis can do it. Kelly can do it. They've got enough credibility up here. So um, Marine Corps Logistics Base uh, in Albany, we, we talked yesterday about the shortfalls in helicopters. We're talking today about shortfalls in uh, amphibious ships in general. Um, you've got two Marine Corps Logistics Centers. Uh, the one in Albany is not, not technically in my district, but uh, I have family that, that works there, uh, although we don't claim each other for fear of termination. Uh, uh, the maintenance on the amphibious assault vehicles, who does that? Is that in Albany or is that in the West Coast Depot? So it may be both, but I'm definitely certain it, it's happening in Albany. Okay. The, uh, and we greatly appreciate the work that is, that is being done there. Um, to include the recovery of the tornado effects Absolutely. In, in January of 17 and, and what's been able to be accomplished by that workforce is nothing short of amazing to include the reset of our equipment from Afghanistan. We're 94%. Uh, we had, I believe almost 87,000 items that were rolled back from combat that needed to be reworked. And we are closing in on the completion of, of resetting that equipment back in Albany. So uh, the tremendous effort by your family members and others in Albany. We greatly appreciate the support of Congress on that. I, I was there shortly after that storm, and we were very fortunate that that tornado was uh, a little bit further to the south, and we would have lost uh, some lives uh, on that base. They did a tremendous job of cleaning up and, and getting things back in order. Uh, what systemic challenges uh, do you have at the Marine Corps Logistics Base in Albany and what changes can we make to help you with any of those challenges? So I'd better defer that to, I can take that for the okay. record if you might, and I'll bring that back to our director for installations and logistics who uh, that was squarely within his portfolio and I can give you a more accurate answer, sir. Perfect, thank you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you December 23rd up here doing our job. <clears throat> and uh, I hope that Madison Kelly will um, Get a, help get us out of this mess by the end of the year. Thank you. I yield. Thank you very much, Congressman Scott. We now proceed to Congressman Joe Courtney of Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, to the witnesses for being here. Um, I would note, um, as Mr. Scott said, we the NDA is uh, now on its way over to the to the White House, which uh, passed with the strongest bipartisan vote um, since 2008. And part of that uh, mark or that bill included the sea power mark, which uh, increased the size of the amphibious fleet by, by one boat above uh, what the president um, sent over. So um, there is some signs of intelligent life, uh, you know, uh, on the hill here. And, um, but obviously, even at that pace, in terms of hitting the, um, the requirement of 38 ships, it's still going to take a while. And, and obviously, in the meantime, you have to figure out the most creative ways possible to, to boost training. And um, General, um, a number of us were over in Australia uh, last summer on a CODEL, and they, they were describing the joint amphibious training exercise that the Marines did in, uh, from Darwin in 2016. I mean, is that maybe another sort of uh, avenue in terms of, uh, again, uh, working with allies in terms of uh, doing joint training exercises to, to, again, sharpen people's skills? Sir, it is. I think you might be referring to tandem thrust that, that occurs on a recurring basis down in, uh, in Australia. So, yes, very much so. Uh, not just in Australia to get aboard their partnerships, but to get aboard ships from the UK, from Spain, France, the Dutch. So what we refer to as an allied maritime basing initiative, particularly in Europe, uh, it's not uncommon to find U.S. Marines aboard our allied partnerships. So in addition to that, our use of alternative platforms, the ESDs the, and the expeditionary support bases like the USS Puller and uh, soon the USS Keith, uh, provides that you know additional capability for us to get aboard a ship and still exercise our aviation elements and our command and control. So we're trying to be as creative as we can with uh, with not just our amphib ships, but alternative platforms as well as allied ships. Uh, thank you, Mr. Russell. Again, your report kind of listed 
again, sort of more creative ways to, um, you know, increase uh, jointness. And, and if you had to prioritize, I mean, what, what do you, of the recommendations, which one is really the one that I think, that you think stands out as uh, probably the most uh, effective in, in the short term? Well, I would say it's a, it's a close call between two of them, but certainly the idea of trying to um, more systematically evaluate the training priorities and uh, establish or look at the, uh, the alternatives uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to the amphibious ships, whether it's maritime prepositioning fleet ships or allied ships, uh, but coming up with a strategic, thoughtful way to, to look and, and balance those resources amongst priorities and alternatives is probably uh, one of the, the top recommendations in order to manage those resources that are available to the best, best we can. Um, and then it goes back also to the, the second recommendation that we, the, we made on naval integration, and that is um, strategically thinking about how you tie together both the Navy and the Marine Corps so that they're looking together at, at some of the joint aspects of it in terms of leveraging availabilities and creating those compatible systems and policies and procedures where the two are working together in, in a more cohesive way. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Courtney. We now proceed to Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler of Missouri. Good morning, gentlemen. <clears throat> Um, in your report, uh, your testimony, General, you talk about how in 1990 the Navy possessed 62 uh, amphibious ships. We have 32 today, and then <clears throat> how there was this, uh, you know, mutually agreed 38 ship requirement. Uh, you also mentioned that Admiral Greenert in April of 2014 said that we need about 50 amphibious gray hulls. So can you give me just a little background on how you settled for 38 and how many do you really think you need? Thank you, ma'am, for that question. The, the number 38 is really centered on uh, a look that occurred in 2009 between the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Chief of Naval Operations has kind of held true since for the past eight years, and that's our requirement to be able to have a forcible entry capability with two Marine Expeditionary Brigades. And so if you look at the number of 38, and then it was determined that 34 was based on the, the uh, perceived funding levels for the future was about 34 ships is what would be fiscally affordable at that time, of which minus 10 percent in maintenance would leave you about 30 operationally available to support the lift of two Marine Expeditionary Brigades. So that's essentially how we got to the 30, or 38. Um, we will get there in FY33. So the risk is between now and fiscal year 2033 on getting that, to that objective level. Yeah, and then I'm it's also the, the additional uh, assumptions that was made on 10% of that fleet being in maintenance. Well, we know that uh, history indicates that we are at a, a higher percentage than 90 percent, uh, less availability, in other words, than, uh, than uh, what we're finding in the yards. And for instance, today, 14 of 32 ships are undergoing maintenance. Mm. Well, this is very concerning. I just uh, <clears throat> returned from South Korea and, and Japan and, and Guam uh, with Chairman Wilson, Madeline Ordayo, and others, and, and saw where our Marines in the past have had to come on the shore at Okinawa and at Guam. And as we look at what's going on in uh, you know, South Korea, we need to have this capability. Your testimony also uh, refers to the concerns with the capacity gaps with mine countermeasures, naval surface fire support. Um, you say we need a modern and capable uh, mine ca counter mine capability facilitate access and the shortfalls. So what that's very concerning as well. Can you tell me more about what you're doing to address these concerns? I can, and then I'll, I'd maybe have Admiral Lewis uh, add any additional, particularly on the mine countermeasures piece. It's a, it's a topic that was brought before the Naval Board, in other words, between the Commandant and the, and the Chief of Naval Operations just a couple of months ago on getting a comprehensive review from the N95, which is uh, expeditionary warfare there within the OPNAV staff, on, on looking at the challenges we have and what are the proposed solutions. We know that we don't have sufficient capacity in that area, but we're looking at things that are un, you know, unmanned capability uh, and uh, other technical, uh, technological improvements in that, in that area. Um, naval surface fire support, we've addressed through the kind of experimentation you've seen again in Don Blitz of trying to look at extending the range of a, of a naval gun, which is about 13 miles today, to, to look at what, cor what kind of Marine Corps systems can we put afloat that will get us ranges out to 43 miles, or perhaps in the future out to a couple of hundred miles. Mm -hmm. And do we take an amphibious ship like a LPD-17 class that may be available to put vertical launch system configuration on that ship and bring a rocket system aboard that isn't there today 
at some relative cost. It may not be that great with the existing systems we have today incorporated for shipboard use that will get us those ranges out to 200 and perhaps uh, tracking what the Army is developing for long-range precision fires, maybe ranges out to 400-plus miles in the future. Mm -hmm. So these are things we're all looking at in terms of filling that gap on naval surface fire support and technological developments on the, uh, on the mine countermeasures. Let me just ask one more question. Uh, the GAO report uh, talked about the virtual training uh, option, and, uh, but it also, anyway, what is the status of your efforts to address GAO's recommendation to develop guidance for the development and use of virtual training devices, and to what extent are Marine Corps virtual training devices able to integrate with Navy devices for the purposes of simulating amphibious operations? Within our Training and Education Command, they have uh, really the portfolio for, for training in general. Uh, and that would reside with uh, Lieutenant General Walsh. And I know they're, they're looking hard at this. Uh, there is a, a uh, Marine Corps simulated training environment uh, concept. Um, I think the GAO report is, is spot on. In, in their assessment on the analysis up front and the evaluation on the back end. But there are some things that we are doing today through simulation that are definite enhancements that allow for our live opportunities to be more effective because we've been able to rehearse some of that, primarily command elements. But you, if you look at the comprehensive array of what's out there in the virtual training world, everything from a, a simulation system for a pilot to rehearse landings on a, on a rolling ship at night in rough seas, to uh, the command and control capabilities we have at a place like Marine Corps Training and Operations Group at 29 Palms, if we look at the ability of our uh, MAGTAF simulation systems on rehearsing a staff's ability to plan in an integrated fashion with the Navy prior to going to sea, we do that routinely with the MUSE. It's called R2P2, Rapid Response Planning Process. So they do use some simulation uh, in, in virtual training to, to go through their preliminary stages. In terms of systems that are designed really for amphibious capabilities outside of, um, uh, you know, what I've referred to in our, we also, have, I'll, I'll rewind the tape a little bit there and say we also have some systems that are applicable to operations ashore. When Marines finally hit the beach, we have a, uh, a squad immersive trainer on both coasts that can be reconfigured to replicate really any kind of environment. It's really kind of at the squad level. Um, so there are things that are applicable that we're doing today ashore that would have certain applicability in amphibious operations, but amphib-specific kinds of simulators, there aren't a lot that we have today, and perhaps none in the Navy, that would get us to where we would want to be in the future. So it's a, it's a system of systems that you can piece together to project what you need to do uh, once the landing force is ashore. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Hartzell. We now proceed to Congressman Trent Kelly of Mississippi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> leave, it to, leave it to a redneck to break something. Uh, you know, um, I, I want to concur in what Austin Scott said. It, it is critical that we not hear mixed messages from the military community, whether that be at the SecDesk level or from our generals or admirals. Uh, CRs kill our readiness. I know that. I currently serve in our guard, and I can tell you it kills our readiness, and you will never hear me say anything other than that. It's not okay for a CR, not a short one, not a long one, not anyone. It is killing our readiness. So I just hope that uh, that message will be heard. Uh, the second part is uh, we've gotten so focused on the coin fight for the last uh, 16 years. Uh, I, I see my soldiers, uh, I, I see young majors, or, or sometimes a little older majors, uh, I see E6s and E7s who uh, don't know how to fight the real fight that we're here for. And at the end of the day, the Marine Corps is not here to do a coin fight. They're real good at that. They're real good at a lot of things. But uh, you guys are here to make force landing on a contested beachhead to get us a foothold uh, to, to go to war with our enemies, to be able to project power from there. It's critical that we have the elements to do those things, we have the training to do those things, and that we focus on those tasks that are critical to us. I mean, that's why we have a Marine Corps. And so I guess going back, naval surface fires, you know, we don't have battleships anymore. We don't have the, uh, we, we, we do not have the ability to have naval, naval surface fire support like we had in the past. Uh, 
tomahawks and casts are great, but they don't do the same things as those big guns on those battleships used to do. And if you're making a force landing, I assure you, you don't want to go where just tomahawks and casts have been because you still got a lot of fighting to do to get through that. Um, how would you rate, uh, General Boudreau, uh, how would you rate the na uh, Naval Surface Fire's readiness and what are we doing to improve it? I'll defer to Admiral Lewis on any improvements to the Naval Surface Fire support platforms. Um, my, my understanding of that, which is afloat, is, is fine. What we are, just as you referred to, Congressman, is a, is a range limitation. Uh, the ship's survivability in a contested environment to close within the ranges that would be required to even get support from a five-inch gun, for instance, is something we're going to have to rethink. So the coin of the realm in the future is long-range precision fires and more ships protection against missile threats and, uh, and, and an air threat, which looking at our potential adversaries and our competitors out there, what they're building, um, stealth capability and likewise is, is something that we, this technological edge we used to have is something we're very aware of, uh, something we're very concerned about and something we need to counter. So survivabilities of the amphibious platforms to get in close is a, is a big concern. Uh, we need to make them more lethal. We need to make them more survivable. And the lethality goes to the naval surface fire support piece, and the survivability gets to the missile defense piece. Admiral, if you can talk that, please. Yes, sir. Um, the contested environment that you referred to uh, in years ago was in close to the, the beachhead. It's now everywhere. If you look throughout the maritime, all straits, you know, the Strait of Hormuz, Malacca Straits, where, wherever, and further out into the maritime. So it's, it's all the battle space now. A priority, a very, very high priority for the Navy is development of long-range precision surface-to-surface -surface fires. That is very much, and it's not just in this fight, it's in what we would call, you know, traditionally a blue water fight, which is very... Uh, been very much of, uh, you know, it's been very blurred in that regard to, from the contested space. Uh, where we are right now in surface surface fires is just over 10 nautical miles, and that's not far enough. Part of that, though, is the systems and the, the command and control systems and the ability to network our capabilities from Navy ships at sea well out to sea, to in close, to onshore. That, that networking is something that we're very focused on with Navy Marine Corps first and with the Air Force and with the Army as we go forward. But that is something that uh, it's a real need. Uh, we're not close to achieving it first. We've got to get to the building blocks per first, which is the basic units and the capability of the Oregon Mu. I thank both of you for your answer. I think that's something we need to really focus on and focus on quick. The bottom line, there's a lot of difference going into a beachhead or a hardened target that has been saturated with our heavy fires uh, than to go in somewhere that has kind of been just kind of hit a little bit. There's a lot of fighting left, and we don't want to lose Marines when we can do that with firepower. And uh, with that, I have it, my time's expired. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Congressman uh, Kelly. We now proceed to Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I just would like to, so I don't have a cool Southern accent, but I would like to uh, associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Kelly and Mr. Scott. Um, I, I really think that now is the critical time to get out from under uh, this problem uh, from a budgetary perspective. I don't think we can afford uh, another CR. And so I think we have to make a stand over the next month. And I know it might seem absurd from your perspective, for us to put the onus on you, given that we are a separate branch of government which provides you with funding, um, and it's our job, but we really need your help, because um, you guys bring a credibility that Congress does not. Congress is rocking a 12 percent approval rating right now. I think you guys have a 90 percent approval rating, so we're going to need your partnership over the next month. By the way, that approval rating is lower than cockroaches and colonoscopies, to give you a sense of how bad <laughs> the problem is right now. Um, because, and I hate to be critical since I've only been here a year, but when it comes to this issue, which should be the most important issue for all of us, it just, it, it, it perplexes me as to why a year into this Congress, we are still 
in this situation when we know how much damage the BCA and sequester has done to our military and how much damage another continuing resolution would do, as the Secretary laid out in the letter to Chairman McCain and some others a month ago. So uh, I just would help ask, second, uh, the sentiments of Colonel Kelly and, and Austin Scott. This next month I view to be as absolutely critical. And I'm not going to support any effort that um, continues to, to punt this problem down the road any further. It's just I can't look my buddies who are still on active duty in the eye uh, given that I'm unexpectedly in this role, and, and do that. So if we have to cancel Christmas, I'm, it's fine with me. Um, I'm happy to stay here, and they should lock us on the House floor until we get this done. Um, so thank you for being here and, and shedding light on these issues. And I just would ask sort of a follow-up of, of what uh, Congresswoman Hartzler suggested. So uh, we know we've gone from 61 amphibs uh, down to 32, and the requirement is 38. Is that correct? I have that right? So can you just give me a sense, um, and forgive me if I miss this, how that impacts our uh, op plans, um, particularly in the Pacific, and whether that should require us to rethink these op plans or rethink whether they're even realistic to begin with? Congressman, just on the evaluation of our ability to, to execute any of the op plans, if uh, if you would permit, I'll, I will take that question because I think it would – I don't want to – breach or sure. wander into any of the classified territory. So I think I can provide you the best, most comprehensive uh, answer sure. in, a, in that classified forum. Sure. Uh, I echo that, but what, what I would I would mirror in, at, at the unclassified level, if um, if if there if there is a uh, a conflict in the Pacific that we're that we're faced with right now and the scenario we're faced with right now, it's not going to be like what we've been faced with over the last 15 years. Uh, and that is a, a large-scale conflict with uh, a considerable risk to a lot of American lives. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is why uh, – and, and our capacity in amphibious ships and Marines and soldiers, airmen – Sailors, Coast Guardsmen is not um, where it needs to be. We're, we're going to go to the fight and we're going to win. Yeah. But uh, that that is a that's a, a real serious thing right right, mm -hmm. right now. And the the, the fact it, of passing a a budget uh, and not having a continuing resolution uh, will get us one step closer to being prepared. Uh, but uh, a a passing a continuing resolution will, as I said on my open remarks, and you, you all have mirrored much better than, than I have, uh, it is, uh, it's just stemmed the, the readiness issues. It hasn't reversed them, and they, we're, in, we're in real need of reversing those readiness issues. Yeah. And that's, that, that was the only thing I would say to, on top of that. Um. Well, I, usually I, I criticize people that use their five minutes to give speeches and not ask questions, but I'm violating that today. I just want to go back to this point. Um, you know, this is our this is the centennial of our, our entry into World War One, and so I've been doing kind of a nerdy deep dive into Wisconsin's history, and we led the opposition to the war. You know, Bob LaFollette, our most famous politician, was the leader of the progressive Republicans and, you know, fought on the Senate chamber to delay arming of merchant vessels and all this. But Notwithstanding that crazy debate that we have that really divided the country, we had a lot of German Americans in Wisconsin. Um, we managed to come together afterwards and uh, do the right thing for the country. And the entire country mobilized in support uh, of our troops. That's not to say it wasn't without problems, and we experienced a lot of the interesting and divisive issues on the home front. But I just feel like this is the time where we got to come together. And I think we can. I, I think we can. Working with you guys, we can do it. Now is the decisive moment. And I believe what we do over the next month can really put us on the right path. Uh, for the next decade or if not longer. So thank you guys for being here and uh, taking the time to shed some light on these critical issues. Congressman, I'd follow up for just one quick note on that, and that probably the greatest degradation we faced under the CR is our inability to do the new starts. And when we talk about building ships, if we can't have new starts, our adversaries and potential adversaries are cranking out new ships once every six weeks. So we find this, again, our, our maritime superiority edge narrowing through this, through the continuing resolutions that is not allowing us to stay on glide path for readiness recovery and, uh, and maintain a superiority on the sea, to be honest with you. 
My time's expired, but I yield. Order. Thank you very much, Congressman Gallagher. And uh, as we conclude, uh, it, it's obvious uh, to you uh, that uh, we really are facing the continuing resolution right now. You are too. Uh, and I appreciate Congressman Scott so eloquently uh, presenting it and backed up, of course, by Congressman Kelly and Congressman Gallagher and uh, Congressman Hartless, Hartzler. And then, and then this may be um, <laughs> lightnings go strike, bipartisan. Uh, with uh, Congressman Bordaio and uh, Courtney. Uh, but uh, it, it really would be helpful to us uh, to have very brief, as I indicated uh, yesterday, and I'll restate, uh, to have examples of increased cost uh, to uh, the, the, the delays uh, that are caused. And then you've actually brought up new items that um, need to be uh, in this very brief uh, one-page letter, uh, and that would be uh, the new starts uh, and, and then uh, and there could be a, a paragraph uh, as to the capabilities of adversaries that have a six-week uh, capability. That, that's just uh, uh, incredible. But uh, well, we need to have facts. Uh, and uh, actually, um, Congressman Gallagher was extremely correct. I was going to point out that uh, we need facts that uh, would be merit-based. But uh, actually, you have credibility. Uh, and, and that would help us, as we explained to our colleagues, the. Um, uh, phenomenal uh, challenges to our country and the risk to our country. And then we could also, uh, once we take some hard votes, uh, we're going to have to go home and explain this to our constituents. And it can be best be done uh, if we're presenting uh, specific um, facts uh, that uh, you can provide. Uh, again, we want to thank you for your service. It's just inspiring to be uh, with such uh, extraordinary individuals, and we appreciate your service, uh, each each of you. And Congressman Badayo, of course, uh, we need to represent, uh, we need to uh, present the wonderful territory of Guam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to go on record to say that I certainly support eliminating the CR. That, and again, just bipartisan, and we, uh, and to uh, address the uh, issue of sequestration, we keep punning. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we want to back you up for, our, for the defense of our country. And with this, we shall be adjourned. <laughs>